<laughs> hey everyone, uh, so glad to be here. Um, some of you folks know me, but for everyone I haven't had the chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Carrie Miller, and I have the immense privilege to talk to you today about, well, mistakes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few historical blunders, a few modern head scratchers, and kind of talk around uh, from a sideways angle some of the challenges and opportunities they pre present. But mostly, I want to tell you a few of the stories of failures that I carry around with me in the back of my own head as I go about my day being an engineer. I'm a senior back-end engineer at GitLab uh, on the code review team, where uh, myself and my team uh, deal with everything that has to do with code reviews and merge requests. Um, beyond just a day job, though, um, I'm also a gamer. Um, I used to be a marionette puppeteer, glass worker, professional poker player. Um, I'm also a long-distance endurance motorcyclist. Um, later this summer, this is the ride I'm going to do going on. Uh, I'm going to try to ride to all 48 contiguous states in the United States uh, in 10 days or less. Um, and I don't know, it might end up in a disaster. I might give up on day four. Um, who knows? But I want to make the attempt. But enough telling you about how cool I am to try to seem relatable and human. Let's get into the topic here. I want to tell you, I want to tell you first the story of a time when I wasn't so cool. I never thought that I was going to be a computer programmer, despite after school classes being privileged to grow up in a household where a computer was available to me. No, I thought I was going to be a, an artist. I couldn't do math. And so when I started college, I pursued a performance production degree, a lighting and set design, primarily with a minor focus in puppets. Now, I loved especially working Shakespearean performances, and one summer was fortunate enough to be a crew slash cast member in a small company performing three different plays by Shakespeare at various venues around town. Now, one night I strode onto stage and proudly spoke the lines, Gracious my lord, I should report that which I say I saw, but I know not how to do it. Now, the other actor looked at me and I looked at him, and clearly he had forgotten his line to prompt me to continue, but whatever, I'll press on. As I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked towards Burnham, and anon methought the wood began to move. This is very important uh, information for the messenger to convey to Macbeth because um, Macbeth is prophesied to be king until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane. Unfortunately, I am not any production of Macbeth. I am any production of Henry V. Now, I could have covered. I could have said something pithy and Shakespeare-y like, oh, but my lord, thou careth not for that trifling news and, and, and gotten onto the real thing. But instead, I said, oh, shit. Because you know what they say about never being the crime but the cover-up? Nailed it. It's one reason I collect stories about mistakes or disasters. And I can't wait to hear the story behind this one. And I include this slide just, just because everyone was messaging me to ask, how many times are you going to talk about that ship and that talk you're doing about mistakes? Well, this is it. Speaking of disasters I really don't want to talk about yet, 2020. Now, I spent most of my time in 2020 uh, at home renewing my love of history, reading more deeply about uh, the early Roman Empire and the Bronze Age collapse, and went even further back to the earliest empires in the Western world. And that's where I discovered the story of someone named Cushion. And I want to introduce you to him today. This three-inch square clay tablet was made in 3100 BCE, and it recently sold at auction for $230,000. It's engraved with the Sumerian pictographic script that predates even cuneiform, and it was kept in the temple of Inanna in Uruk, uh, which is southern Iraq, um, and it's one of 77 pictographic tablets that were found there that we can tell were written by the same person. Whose handwriting is on this tablet? Well, it's Cushion. And Cushion has a distinction of being the first person in history whose name that we know. This is his name here. It consists of two pictograms. That sort of lowercase i shape is Ku, and the fuzzy vase is the... Uh, symbol for Shin, Cushin. Now, historians are confident this is his name because it appears on 17 tablets, and it's often accompanied by the title of Sangha. Uh, it's a title for head priest or functionary or middle manager of a temple. So what is he recording on this tablet? Now, tablets don't always follow a top to bottom, left to right, right to left kind of arrangement here. So you may have to tilt your head to the side, but there's three symbols here. Now, that top one is a symbol for barley. The one in the middle is a brick building with a chimney, uh, believed to be a brewery. And the bottom one is a conglomerate pictograph of barley and the symbol for exchange or trade. So on this tablet, Cushion is tracking having received a shipment of barley at the brewery. This set of symbols is the time period involved, uh, and it is in base 10. Large black dots are 10s, uh, and the little bowl shapes are 1s. So this indicates a time period of 37 months. 
Now, Sumerians used a 12-month lunar calendar, and because there are 13 lunar months in a normal solar year, basically they had to have a leap month every three years. So from that, we know that this tablet is recording a time period of three full modern solar years. But how much barley are we talking about here? Now, this is a little bit tricky for us uh, because Sumerians used a combination of base 6, base 10, and base 12 numbering systems. And the size of the mark matters as well, and there's some other complications. And I'm sure that it made sense to them, but it's a bit harder for us since we're trained for base 10 and we have zeros. But if you know what the math to do and you actually go through and do the math, and if you know their base unit here we're talking about is a vessel that's about 5 liters in capacity, what we're recording is 135,000 liters of barley. This is another tablet also by Cushion, uh, and this tablet is re believed to be a cheat sheet of sorts. Now the middle column uh, we've deciphered to be uh, a series of equations that tell us the amount of barley and malt that we need for brewing different size batches of beer. In the upper left hand corner, uh, if we have CamBot zoom in, um, here we have uh, basically a multiplication table of serving sizes. To read this you need to know that a dot equals 10 units again, and that fractions are written by grouping bowls together. So the number of bowls in the group uh, together um, is the denominator of the fraction. So it works out here that for this row, uh, we have 20 quarter units will result in five units. Elongated bowl on its side is five. I'm, I hope that makes some sense. And using my wonderful powers, I can see through the internet and I can tell that you're with me. Here's another example. Uh, here we have one dot or 10 times one third, which would give us, you're right, three and one third. You see, you got this, you're doing great. Here we have a sideways bowl, which is five times one half, which gives us, Five. When Cushion scribed this tablet, he accidentally put a five where he should have put a 10. He put a sideways bowl instead of a dot. Now we know this is a mistake because we have other copies of the same information on different tablets also written by Cushion, and those tablets do not have this error in them. So poor Cushion. Yes, he is the first person whose name we know. He's also the first person who made a math mistake and the first person to be identified via get blame. But that's not even that bad a typo, right? It's just a math mistake. For top 10 typos in history, well, do you know about the so-called Wicked Bible? It's also called the Sinner's Bible, and it's an edition of the King James Bible that was put out in 1631. It was well-received, uh, it was well, uh, well subscribed to. There was one problem. In the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shall commit adultery. King Charles I, king at the time, was not amused, and neither was the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is quoted here as basically saying that back in his day, people actually cared about details, not like the kids these days. The printers were hauled over from the Star Chamber, where they were found guilty <clears throat> of blasphemy or sin against the, the, the church, but they were fined 300 pounds and lost their license to print books entirely. No one knows exactly how many copies were actually made, but they destroyed as many as they could find when the error was discovered. They didn't get them all, however, and 15 are still known to exist. And in fact, if you've got $100,000 lying around, there's one for sale right now on Abe Books. It's a pretty good price, and it's a great deal in shipping, actually. The point that I want to make here, if you leave with one thing today, is that we humans are storytellers. When we talk about mistakes or successes, it's part of human nature to see ourselves as the hero of the story. So we interpret events where we might only be to tangential guest stars to be solely about us. We might think that <clears throat> we, we might only have been tagged in on an issue or added in Slack. And by the time we actually logged on, the problem was long solved. But I'm still happy to take the credit when my boss asks about it. Of course, we inversely talk down our level of involvement when we're talking about mistakes. Either that mistake was someone else's fault, or I'm just an innocent bystander, or somehow I'm at the mercy of the code. We all feel this pull. Since we're all human, and just like Cushion, we make mistakes. But we're not the victims of software, we're the authors. We invented math and writing to do things our brains simply aren't very good at. So it's no wonder that for many people, math and logic and programming are really quite difficult. To a greater or lesser degree, humans simply aren't wired for this. Well, the engineers who wrote the software that plagues you today are humans, just like you and me and Cushion. And we have to give them credit for the challenges they face in the moment if we want to talk honestly about success and failure. See, software is essentially a compromise. 
it seeks to solve a human problem, and it often represents the conclusion of an argument between what's proactive and what would be pragmatic. The solution that it, that it offers only cover a portion of the possibilities in which it will operate, so software will eventually fail us, all software. So where do we find the strength and the resilience, the bravery, to continue forwards towards finding these real solutions if we're doomed to always fail? Once you accept that you can't know everything, it's really a short step to begin to question how much you can actually know at all, given that we can't even quantify what the limits of knowledge are, much, much less define what software is or how it would operate. It's a bit of a cliche, I know, uh, to look back and wish we knew then what we knew now, but it's often only in retrospect that we see the value of knowledge that we've gained. When I asked people uh, a few years ago for a talk what they wish they'd known about programming before they even started, almost every single person said that software was all about people. And seldom will you ever be purely on your own. There's always a team of people contributing to the success of a project. So communicating intent and developing empathy to understand the perspective of others, that's what allows you to multiply the efforts of everyone around you. Develop the skills to work with other people in a constructive, positive manner in a way that brings out the best of those around you. There's almost nothing to be better to have a reputation for. So learning to work with other people, communicating over email, learning to be a whole individual, these are valuable skills that employees, uh, excuse me, employers typically look for. Tech is a team sport, but even as we multiply the success of those around us, we also run a risk of compounding and multiplying the effect of small individual mistakes. Hmm. A series of small individual mistakes collide in the story of Vasa in 1628. Now it's a fairly famous engineering disaster that you might have heard of, and I guess it's famous in engineering disaster circles anyway. In a nutshell, Vasa was ordered built by the King of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus, uh, in 1625 as part of Sweden flexing her military muscles against Poland and Lithuania. She was built by a private corporation using a mix of public employees and contractors. And she was lavishly decorated. Uh, she represented the ambitions of the king both for himself and for Sweden and it was one of the most powerfully armed vessels in the world when it launched. So the shipwright, Henrik Hybertsen, had signed a contract for, for building four ships, and he had gone, gone ahead and cut the wood and started construction, and he was using the same exact designs he'd used on other ships in both Sweden and his native Holland. At the time, engineering principles of shipbuilding hadn't really been worked out and formalized. There was no book of tables or uh, coursework that you could take or ratios to look up. Ships were all bespoke, artisanal, one-of-a-kind affairs, and they were built by master craftsmen, more by eye and imitation than anything we recognize in our modern assembly line-driven world. Variation between ships was more than common, and it was a feature of, of how they were built at the time. Master Henry had a reputation for building fast, stable craft. So when the king, um, having lost 10 ships in a naval engagement in 1625, demanded that they actually change plans and build an even larger ship, Master Henrik was able to push back and say no and continue on with his work. Except later that year, Master Henrik fell seriously ill and was forced to retire from shipbuilding completely. He handed the entire project over to another Dutch shipwright who was also confusingly named Henrik, we'll call him Henrik the Younger. And, excuse me, Henrik the Younger had apparently no problem acceding to the suggestions coming from the king. Now, he couldn't make it longer, but since he only really laid down the keel, he could use the mo a model, he could model uh, the ship that he was building on a different ship, and that different ship actually had two gun decks, which would allow them to carry twice as much cannon. And he also offered to bolt on literally tons of ornamentation and filigree to make it even grander, more ostentatious ship. So the ship is built and it's completed. In, uh, August, on August 10th, 1628, Thousands turned up on the shore to watch the launch of this newest warship. The day was calm, the weather was fine, there was only a slight breeze from the southwest. The ship was hauled out to the edge of the harbor, um, where its four sails were set, and it began to make its way to the east. They opened up the gun ports and they rolled up the guns to fire a salute uh, to the city of Stockholm as they were leaving. But as it passed a series of bluffs to the south of the harbor, a gust of wind filled its sails and it suddenly heels over to port. They lower the sails, and the ship very slowly righted itself as the gusts passed. However, a few minutes later, an even stronger gust of wind again forced the ship over to its port side, this time pushing those open lower gun ports under the surface, 
This allowed water to rush into the lower gun deck, and the ship couldn't right itself fast enough, so it was taking on water through the gun ports at a furious rate. It sank very, very quickly, uh, barely a mile from where it had left port, and 30 sailors were unable to escape uh, the inflow of water and lost their lives. So the king's off in Poland fighting his war, and it takes a couple weeks for him to get the, get the news. Uh, and as you might expect, he was furious, and he demanded that somebody be held to account. The captain was interrogated, as were the crew. Was everybody sober? A lot of focus was paid to the gun ports being open, and whether or not the cannons were secured properly. But the captain and the crew pointed their fingers at the, at the shipbuilders. Why was the ship so tall and narrow? A tall and narrow ship would be tippy and able, unable to right itself quickly. And in fact, this had been shown in early trials while it was still at dock, but no one was willing to tell the king that two years of effort had to be scrapped, or that delivery of Vasa to the navy would be delayed. Henrik the Younger blamed Henrik the Elder, swearing that, I'm just following this guy's designs, when we know that he actually modified them during building, resulting in such a tippy ship. So, with no guilty party to be found, Blame was placed on Henrik the Elder, who very conveniently had passed away at this time from the illness that had forced him off the project. It was a safe political ending, and everyone saved face. Now, in the 1950s, the shipwreck was uh, rediscovered after being lost, essentially, for 300 years, and it was raised from the ocean shore in 1959. Modern principles of shipbuilding were applied to build scale models of Vasa, and it was discovered that it was, in fact, too tall, exactly as the tests at the dock had shown. It was also shown that because those gun ports were open, that was the reason why it took on so much water. So it was the collision of these two minor mistakes created a disaster that just looked like a ship. Now, Voss was kind of obvious, right? Changing specifications, a belief that design patterns are implementation patterns, toxic cultures where honest communication about problems with a plan or ignored in favor of meeting arbitrary deadlines set by executives far away from day-to-day -day details, that's one reason why we study Vasa. But not everything that looks like a mistake is a mistake per se. Some ideas are too early or too radical or simply don't bring enough obvious benefit to support their adoption. We, they wanted more and more cannon and larger and larger ships, which resulted in the Vasa. The guy who came before the king who built Vasa tried to get his people to adopt a base eight numbering system. Kodak, for decades, used internally a 13-month metric calendar. Both ideas have demonstrable advantages, but it's not enough to convince a wider world that it is invested in other solutions. Perhaps calling something a mistake or a disaster is less a matter of empirical truth and merely a more a matter of perspective and interpretation. Because it's difficult to adopt new ideas, especially ones that are fundamentally orthogonal to our existing paradigms. Christian used a base 12 system for counting, just as our base 10 system is likely due to counting on our fingers, Sumerian's base 12 system is suspected by anthropologists to have risen through a similar biomechanical origin by counting on their knuckles. You have three knuckles and four fingers, you end up with 12. Now, both systems are perfectly functional, understandable, and intuitive to the cultures in which they arose, and they operate on a real human scale, so we're able to comprehend them. But base 7? Now, that's outside of our biomechanics. There's nothing about us that is 7. We don't interact with the world in patterns of seven or anything. So it's unnatural to us. Base 20, we do have 20 fingers and toes, but at that point we're approaching the edge of our short-term memory of memory's ability to hold ordered data. See, it's flexible of course, but there's a reason why we have top five lists. We have a limited amount of space in our mental buffer for holding ideas together. Once we go beyond a certain number of items, and it's different for everyone, but seven is what you usually find in literature, once we go beyond this number, our brain shifts to a different form of working with the world around it. We count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then suddenly we're thinking about, well, lots and lots and lots. We shift from discrete identification to begin to see groups of things. Now, obviously we make distinctions between different sized groups of things. One group is, well, it's more than seven and less than 20, or, well, it's more than 100. But when we're thinking about it at that point, it's our scale has changed. And this is something you find it's very fundamental to humans as a whole and to uh, it's a major factor in UX design where we don't want to overwhelm users with too many options. And UX design uses such ideas as well as other ways that humans operate on a fundamental or culturally applicable manner to work with users rather than against them. 
I'm sure we've all come across user interfaces that are mind-bogglingly overwhelming. So a few years ago, Revlon, um, lipstick, eyeshadow, perfume, not Revlon, they decided to buy a rival company. Now, to do so, they did a lot of complex financing deals, but what's important at the end of the day is they borrowed billions of dollars and they hired Citibank to act as their loan servicing agent. Now, a loan servicing agent is basically the single point of contact for lenders and borrowers. Citibank tells Revlon how much to pay each month. Revlon puts that money into an account, and then Citibank is responsible for dispersing those funds to the people Revlon owes money to. Citibank doesn't actually own any of the debt. They're just an accountant. You with me so far? I know you are. Early in 2020, um, Revlon found itself in a position that no company likes to be in, namely that its liquidity position is extremely tight. Revlon is in trouble. And there's really only two ways this story is going to end for, for most companies in Revlon's position. They're either going to suddenly discover some groundbreaking new way to make a pile of cash in a hurry, or they pay off their debts by selling the company, a uh, debt for equity swap. And it's, look, if you don't pay your mortgage, the bank gets to take your house. Same deal. So Revlon did what any company in the situation does, and it tried to make, excuse me, it tried to buy time by spinning out ever increasingly complex debt restructuring deals to improve its situation. Sort of a high finance version of uh, paying the power company but putting off the cable bill. And again, these details of the deal aren't really important, except in so much that they've pissed off the metaphorical cable company here. So lenders who weren't part of the deal we're not going to get paid their principal. They're, they're a very large payment every month. They're only going to get a pittance of interest to hold them off. And they're mad, fighting mad, like fighting in court mad. So imagine they're surprised when only 20 hours before their threatened deadline to begin the lawsuit, Citibank, the accountant, simply wired them the full balance of the money that was owed by Revlon, $900 million, instead of the $8 million they were expecting as an interest payment. Now, at first, they thought, Huh, apparently Revlon did have money. I guess lawsuits work. And we actually know that's what they thought because we got their chat logs. This was short-lived, however. A couple hours later, Citibank sent them a series of increasingly frantic emails saying, huh, that wire transfer, <laughs> that, that was a mistake. Um, just, you can give us the money back. But the lenders were owed the money. It was money that they were legally entitled to. So their response was essentially, eh, finders keepers. What the heck happened here? This screen happened. As the court decision, um, and you knew this was going to go to court, right? As this, the court decision uh, put it, um, there are certain technical limitations and a, quote, very manual process. But basically, you do this fancy pay some people but not others thing. Three, and only three, of these checkboxes had to be selected. Principal, front, and fund. Well, they only checked principal. Now, they're not dummies after all, and Citibank actually has what they call a six eyes policy. Three people have to sign off on any transaction like this, and it looked fine to them. It was their everyday sort of transaction that did it. But the result was that instead of the $8 million being sent as an interest payment from the Revlon account, $900 million was sent to fully pay off the loans, $900 million from the Citibank account. And it took a couple hours for the reality of the situation to dawn on Citibank, but now, thanks to the court decision, instead of being an agent, they are now the proud, if unplanned, owners of almost a billion dollars of increasingly worthless Revlon debt. Citibank is now in the cosmetic business. It was a rough day at Citibank, all because of a checkbox. If you see one talk on mistakes, you'll see a dozen of them, and we always talk about mistakes as being opportunities to learn something new. Um, one of my favorite examples of that is Play-Doh. It was invented when a chemist was trying to invent a new kind of wallpaper cleaner, which actually is really interesting to me because it led me to ask that, I mean, did you even know there was an original kind of wallpaper cleaner? You can clean wallpaper? I didn't know that. If we take anything from the story of Cushion, though, perhaps it should be not that every culture eventually invents intoxicants, but that we exist on the opposite ends of a very long line a continuous chain of mistakes, errors, typos, and just general failure. Hard stuff is hard, not only because of the effort it takes, but because of the cost of a mistake or the risk of it. 
I recently saw a thread on Twitter arguing against iterative development processes, against Agile, and in favor of return to waterfall methods, where we plan out as much of the project before we start. And I sure wish I was uh, that smart to be able to predict everything that could possibly go wrong in a project, regardless of its size. No, there are some failure points that are easy to predict, right? Like things we've experienced before. If I've touched a hot stove and I burned myself, well, now I know not to touch hot stoves, right? Classic example. But I don't have to touch it myself, of course. As a human, I can watch you touch it and get hurt. And thanks to empathy, I know not to touch it myself. These are direct experiences, though. But when we go beyond that, we instead rely on our imagination. Now, if I've never touched one, I've never, and no one I know is dumb enough to touch a hot stove around me, but I've heard stories of people doing it, well, it makes sense, right? Because hot things are hot, and so maybe be careful around hot stoves. But still, we're already starting to tread in that special category of, it won't happen to me because I'm special. And this is where it gets worse. When we think that something is impossible to happen, like there's no way that stove could be hot because the hot surface light isn't on and it isn't even plugged in. We see this in how many injuries and deaths are caused each year because someone thinks that there's no way the car is in gear. Or the, oh, I, I'm sure the brake is set. This is the realm of many of our most surprisingly failures, if not our most interesting. This is where it's the bank shot, never in a million years, a string of coincidences lining up at just the right time to expose just the right series of flaws. That's when those kinds of failures happen. And in complex, ambitious systems, the sort most working professionals work on, they attract these kind of failure chains like ants to a picnic. When we go beyond that, though, there are failure modes that we completely ignore because they're entirely outside the realm of possibility for our industry, or so we assume. We only vaguely worry about fires and earthquakes, uh, vindictive data center employees with axes, um, bad solder on motherboards, alligators in the office, and until recently, the need for everyone to suddenly start working remotely. The hardest, though, to imagine, of course, are the ones we've never even heard of. And that's where stories of other disasters from uh, other industries and other times we can connect to and bring those experiences into our work. Going back to ancient Rome for a minute, um, we always think of ancient Rome as this great city made of uh, gleaming white marble full of statues and gold thunderbolts and whatnot. But the truth of the matter is that most of Rome during the empire would have been made of brick, red fired clay bricks and tiles. Now this is a photo of a Roman apartment building. Uh, it was built in the late second century CE and it's still standing almost 2000 years later. But this is what Rome would have looked like if you were just walking down the street. This is the Trajan market and it was built in the mid first century CE. Now, the Imperial Roman style of building is called uh, Opus Latiricium, uh, which literally means brickwork, and I'd like to show off that I can speak a little Latin. Uh, and this, uh, this technique is where bricks face a core of that other amazing Roman invention, Opus Caementicium, which we now refer to as cement or concrete. It's 2,000 years, and we haven't come up with anything better. Now, Rome had a ferocious appetite for concrete and for bricks and tiles. They used it a uh, massive amount of it. Uh, they also built their hypercost systems, which were the underfloor heating systems and, and um, uh, pools and baths and things. And with so much demand, brick and tile making was a huge industry in Imperial Rome. The scale required to meet the demands of the Romans were massive. And we start to see here the beginning of communal wide-scale industry. Individual brick and tile makers were engaged in piecework. They were paid not for working at a factory, but for the number of lines of uh, number of tiles and brick that they would produce. So individual craftsmen would fire their work in large communal kilns uh, after making it in their shops and letting it dry in the sun. They would mark their products though with a maker's mark to mark what pieces were theirs. Now, usually it's just a symbol, a swirl of the fingers or a pattern, but if you knew letters, you might mark your name or the lot number or the client that you were making the tiles for. Later, more organized craftsmen might have made a stamp uh, in order to identify their wares. Now, the sharp-eyed among you will maybe notice that this stamp is actually backwards. Now, this sort of thing is found on Roman tiles and bricks far more often than you might expect. Um, and the likeliest explanation is that the person who made the stamp uh, was literate, but didn't know it was whatever they were making was going to be used for stamping into clay, and so didn't think to reverse the letters. Or that the tile maker was illiterate and didn't realize it was reversed. But is this really a mistake? Doesn't this mark the tile just as much 
um, as belonging, belonging to that craftsperson as if the name is in the correct orientation? Do we need to be pedantic about what something is correct? What actually is a flaw? Is this a flaw? We've got thousands of tiles with cat prints on them because in Rome, cats were everywhere. I mean, that's what they used to keep mice and rats in check. And it wasn't just cats that have left their footprints in tiles and bricks. We've got puppy prints galore. So far, prints of cats, dogs, sheep, goats, deer, and even pigs have been discovered on tiles. We even have human footprints, hand prints, shoe prints, boot prints, sandal prints. In fact, these kind of markings, people and animals walking over wet clay, they're so absolutely unremarkable, archaeologists don't even mention them really in records. But for the lay people, it provides us with an example. It's a real human connection to a breathing, living world from 2,000 years ago. And it's a pretty spectacular story. It's been said that there are no new stories, only new characters and settings. And that when everything in our world, in our postmodern world, is a reference to something else, we should embrace that. We may stand on the shoulders of giants, but that is not the end of our story. We're the inheritors of a technical tradition, but it doesn't have to end with us. We are temporary stewards of software as a craft, as a grand endeavor to solve human-sized problems. Code is a living thing. It's always changing and evolving. And we cannot grasp it in its entirety, and so we tend to personify and anthropomorphize it. We see ourselves aligned against it. Over time, every individual change that we poured sweat and care into ceased to be distinct. Before long, the code has just always been this way. But every line, every call, every message, every commit, every patch is a choice that was made by somebody who followed a complex and rich path to arrive with the code at that moment. It's the nature of what we do forced to, that forces us to look at pixels and think about bits and memory and variables, but not the larger image that they resolve into, software that does something for people. Our stories define us. When you know your story, your world expands. Once you know what your story is, you can change it. And we're all just another link on the end of this long chain of people screwing things up. And I'm okay with that. I find comfort in that actually, because I'm just like all the other links before me and I'm like all the other links that'll come. I strive to be as strong as I can be and hold together, but we all fail when conditions are right. The story of failure then from the immediate past brings some sense of relief because I can identify with those people. Thank goodness we don't write software that way anymore like they did in the 90s or the aughts. We can go even further back to the earliest days of our craft, software engineering, to the 60s and 70s, and see that the engineers then were struggling with the same exact problems that plague us today. Go look up some white papers from the 60s and 70s, you'll find people talking about cap theorem and object-orientedness and database robustness and how complexity drives the likelihood of failure. The giants whose shoulders we stand on struggle just as much to understand what it is we do as we do today. We humans relate to our world then by telling stories about it to ourselves and to each other. And with code, we have the tools to tell ourselves again the story of how it came to be. And we can look to stories about other code bases to tell us the story of our code. And even further afield, because our field is so young, we can look to other stories and other fields of human experience to understand how software can fail and how it can succeed. We can use these stories to answer questions like, what does software do? How can software be better? What does software long to become? And that's why I keep saying that we need more storytellers and less facts. I wanna read more sonnets and less dictionaries. We need to refuse to work and live only in pixels. We need to find a better, greater narrative for ourselves and our code. We need to find a story worth living. Thank you so much. That's me. Um, I'm everywhere at Carrie's or on the internet. Um, thank you so much for listening to my talk on the stakes. I hope that it goes well for you. Take care.